Hello, and welcome to Eastern Hills Church. We are so glad you're here with us. Whether you know nothing about the Bible, God, or the church, or whether you've been involved with the church and following the Lord for many years, it's about taking the journey together and helping each other out along the way. So come join us and give us the privilege of doing life with you. We have a number of ways to do just that. You can connect and share with us anytime using Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. Or you can check us out on our website, ehwc.org. You can also connect with us using the Church Center app on your tablet or smartphone, where you can check for upcoming events, small group studies, online giving, and so much more. We are so happy you're here with us and happy to celebrate the good news of Jesus with you. People who have had a huge impact over time are those who have stood out from the crowd, who have had the courage to stand alone. Their actions are so stark that it cannot go unnoticed. This week, we will see how one act of courage can impact a whole nation, and that act of courage could be yours. We will be studying Daniel 3 in our series, Long Haul Leadership. Good morning, church. Happy Buffalo Summer Sunday. It's another nice one. So would you stand, and since we're all in a good mood because it's so nice outside, take a second to greet people. Now, I know some of you are close to others, so like make contact, say hi. If you're far away, you can wave, you can fist bump. Just let people know that you are here and that you're glad to see them.
Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with but repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation. In his blood, Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. There is another in the fire standing next to me, there is another in the wall. Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding the power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody And the power lives Let's sing that again There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas should I ever need reminding? Power set me free. There is a grave that holds nobody. Now the power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, oh, oh there is another. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding? Could you? to me I count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust Him, how I prove Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust Him. Just to trust His cleansing blood Just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove Him Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, 
a lyric in one of the songs we sing. It says, don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. And I really believe that today, Jesus wants to reinforce that to our hearts. However we came in here, the Lord wants to tell us, God is madly in love with you. And once we understand and really believe that, we can fulfill the next line of the song that says, take courage, hold on, be strong, and remember where your help comes from. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. So maybe you came here today because you needed to hear about God's good, good grace. Maybe you are in the middle of a fire and you needed to know that there is another one in the fire with you today. Maybe you needed to know how sweet it is to trust in Jesus. Whatever reason you walked in these doors today, we are so glad that you are here. So welcome to church. And for those joining us online, welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here. I, my name is Donna, and I um, get to work with the kids and the students and the wonderful, awesome volunteers that um, serve with our children and youth here at Eastern Hills Church. And so I can't wait to tell you about some of the things that are happening here at church have happened this week and a couple of things that are coming up real soon. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to ask you at some point during the service, if you could take a moment to take the connection card out from the pew in front of you and fill that out. If you are online or if you have the Church Center app, you can also do your connection card on that Church Center app. It's a wonderful thing. You get to share your prayer requests, your praises with us, and just help us to know, you know how you're doing. We want to stay connected with you. If you are brand new here this morning, welcome. We're so happy that you're here, and we want to get a chance to say hello. And so if you would head over to the Connection Center following the service, there will be some staff members there and some awesome volunteers. We have a little welcome gift we would love to place in your hands and just get a chance to say hello to you. Um, if you, um, again, if you have that Church Center app, you can follow along with the notes for today's sermon on that as well. You can also give through the Church Center app, and there are many other ways to give as well that are listed up here on the board. Um, our giving helps the kingdom work keep happening around here, and so it is such a great honor to be a part of that. So this past week, um, we had our Regen ministry. So Regen is one of our discipleship care groups here at Eastern Hills Church. We had some people that committed to, to going ahead and digging into God's word and have some transformation happen in their lives over this past year. And this past Thursday night was the commissioning service. And so we just want to celebrate with those people. God transformed lives through this. And so I thought we could just take a moment, just lift up a praise clap to those who went through that. We are celebrating your faithfulness to that program. Thank you to um, Bobby Crayling, who oversees that ministry, and for all the great work that has taken place. God is good and God is working. And so as we continue to look towards this coming week, if you have a family, you have kids, you know a family, you have grandchildren, you have nieces and nephews, we have our Fam Jam Family Water Night coming up this Friday night at um, 6 o'clock. We've got some huge slides that we rented, some inflatables and some slip and slides and a foam machine. And there's a little uh, water wall for the, the little ones, our little preschool age kids and sprinklers and bubbles and you name it. If it's fun and it's water, we got it going and some wonderful frozen treats. So bring your lawn chairs, bring your beach towels and your, your blankets and just come and join with the family of God and whoever you want to bring with you. It is a free event and it's a wonderful time for people 
to just kind of get in community and talk. If you feel like, hey, I've been coming here a while, but I don't really know a lot of people, this is a place for you to come and just sit and, and hang out on this Friday night and get to know some more people. We hope that you come. We just finished, just actually, just uh, 15 minutes ago, walked out of our mega camp training, and it was wonderful. We, had, we were set up for 60 people, and we were putting more chairs out. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of the awesome volunteers that have said yes to create this Vacation Bible School, this VBS um, experience for our kids starting August 2nd through August 4th. If you have a child that is preschool, we have a, we have a mini mega camp for our littles. So if they have finished three-year-old pre, uh, preschool um, up through four-year-old preschool, they can come to mini mega camp on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And we're going to have an amazing time with our kids. If you are just saying, you know what, I can't be a part of it. I don't have kids. But I'm going to ask you this. Would you pray? Would you pray for the Holy Spirit to come up and just work in amazing ways in those kids' lives? Because we know that these camp opportunities are times when children make a decision for Jesus and it can change the whole trajectory of their life. And so please pray for that. We are going to continue with our series of long haul leaderships and um, Pastor Pat is going to come and lead us in the word. So glad you're here. This has been quite a morning for us. And, and um, uh, last week, I, we ended the service, and I was talking about uh, how we need to trust God even when things are not going well. And I told you about some of the things that have been happening around the building. And I had to smile this week because um, uh, our, our phone router, our phone is a, a VoIP phone. It's an internet phone. Our, our router for our phone system died this week. It's another thing that happened. And now today, we had another power outage at our building on Wednesday night. And now today, if you see flickering up here or words disappearing or whatever, that power outage apparently has caused negative effects on our system. We've been having technical problems all morning. Um, I don't think we're probably online because that's been knocked out. So we're having all kind of great things happen around here. So I just have to smile after a while because God is still God, and these are first world problems. If we were sitting in China or Jamaica or somewhere in Africa, we wouldn't be thinking about those things. We'd be thinking about here we are together, and the Word of God is still powerful, and God is good. Amen? So uh, I, I want to have a time of confession today. Uh, because as we continue this series, we had some tires uh, brought in just to remind us of when the rubber meets the road, but also just they're, they're a good reminder that we're on this journey and we're talking about long haul trucking, long haul leadership. Uh, and we said that leadership is this, doing the next right thing in each season. Um, and, and as we do that, we see God moving us forward. No matter how hard it is to do it, we're going to do the next right thing. Well, to do the next right thing, you've got to be on the road. And so uh, the concept that I wanted to communicate today, I thought, what's the best way to get this across? And, and I came up with the idea of speed limits. Now, here's the time of confession for all of us. And it amazed, well, it didn't amaze me. I, I just was glad because I was at the, uh, the, the com uh, commissioning ceremony for Regen this past week, and it was church, man. It was so good to hear how God had transformed lives. And, and there was brutal honesty in the room, which was great. Now, I want to see how brutally honest we are going to be here, too. How many of you have ever been stopped for speeding? Raise your hand. 
See, you bunch of lawbreakers. I was amazed at how many people all across have gotten stopped for speeding. I'm not going to ask how many times uh, one lady told me between services she could teach the class uh, because she's been to it that many times. But I want us to think about speed limit signs and what they represent. Speed limit signs, I realize when I have gone through them, and I'm amazed at how my phone and my mass program on my phone knows exactly what sign I'm beside because it tells me what the speed limit is. I don't, if I don't see a sign for a little bit, it tells me on my phone. And when I get to the next sign, it changes to that sign immediately. I thought, how does my phone know that? Now, I get it. There's, there's satellites up there, and it's beaming a signal and everything, but it's pretty amazing to me. But here's a couple things about speed limit signs. First of all, did you set the speed limit or did somebody else? Somebody else, right. Who enforces the speed limit? Somebody else. We don't get to enforce that ourselves. If you've ever been through Darien, or you've been south, headed down toward Geneseo and gone through Mount Morris, you will find that there are very faithful people that man those two areas, and they're very happy to enforce the speed limit. In fact, we have friends that were down at Mount Morris here this past week, and they were there for a, a camping experience for their kids, and they went into downtown Mount Morris to have dinner. I can tell many of you have not been to Mount Morris because that's a funny statement that I just made. Mount Morris is not a big place, but they spent the evening in, in the metropolis of Mount Morris, and they observed as they came in, walked through the streets a little bit, and then exited Mount Morris. Within an hour's time, the faithful police officer down there stopped four different people and gave them tickets. And so he's very serious. The town did very well in that hour. Very serious about enforcing the speed limit. Now, what's the purpose of the speed limit? Well, the purpose of a speed limit, especially lower speed limits like this one, 25, and somebody asked me, is it legal to even have this sign? I asked Miss Donna, she gave it to me whether it was legally obtained and she didn't answer me, so I'm not sure. <laughs> In any case, when you get down this low, you know as well as I do that it feels like you're standing still when you're going 25. But the reason why 25 or 30 miles an hour is there is because there's children in the area or there's other reasons why it's important that you slow down and you pay attention to what's going on because something needs to happen or could happen in that zone. I want us to think about that as far as spiritual things are concerned. Because when I was young, one of the issues that I dealt with as somebody that was coming to faith is this. There were several times, and I was plagued with guilt. And, and there is guilt and shame that's associated with sinning. And what I found is that there were several times that I went through seasons where I would emotionally respond to shame and guilt or truth that was spoken into my life, and I would cry, and I'd make great promises about how life was going to be different for me, and i get through the moment, and then i just go and do life the way I always did it before. And I thought, well, what does it really mean? We talk as Christians about being saved. What does it mean to be saved? And how do you know if you're saved? And I wondered that for other people that I knew that claimed to be Christians, and yet I knew them away from any church setting, and their life didn't look any different than other people I knew that didn't claim to be Christians and weren't Christians. And, and I, I thought through what the Bible had to say about that. And, and how do you know if anybody's saved? And here's what I came to, that salvation for us is not determined by great declarations that we make. We can all make all kind of great declarations, but it's about life transformation. And if a life has not been changed, I mean, the Bible says things like this. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Everything's become new. That's life transformation. It says in Romans 8 that if we've been truly changed, the Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. Now, I'm not talking about perfection, not yet. I've often preached, and you've heard me say over and over again, God is looking for progression, not perfection yet. But I believe that too often, and I've gotten to too many times with too many funerals, 
where I've walked alongside people. And we desperately, for ourselves and for those that we love, we desperately want to believe that when the moment of death comes, that that person is going to be safely in the hands of God. And God is trustworthy to deal with that justly. But too often I've heard that they were at a camp when they were this time, or they were this and they went through this experience, or they said this. And yet, if there's no transformation of a life, no evidence of transformation of a life, then were they truly saved? And again, I'm not trying to raise doubt in anybody's mind. I'm not trying to cause pain for anybody. I just desperately weep for the fact of I want to look at the issue. How do we know that we're saved? And the thing that the Bible keeps coming back to, by the fruit of their life, you'll know them. By this, you will know them. Salvation is demonstrated by life transformation and not just our declarations. And I want to see that to be true in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, the king, as we look at Daniel today. Look with me at the end of chapter 2. I want to pray, and then I want to get into this message to look at some signs and maybe to get us to slow down a little bit and to think through this. Pam came across a study not long ago that says only 2% of people in our country think on a regular basis, really are putting energy into assessing life by thinking. A majority of us tend to just kind of respond or react, and we don't think through. Because I don't know about you, but I see that there's so many things happening in our culture that if people would really think about what they're saying, they could not come to the conclusion that they come to. But yet many of us don't think. And so I I want us to really spend some time thinking today. Let me pray. Father, in these next moments, it's really important the truth we're going to hear. And by your spirit, I pray that you'll do what David wrote in the psalm. Search me, O God. Know my thoughts. Know me. Try my anxious thoughts. See if there be anything that needs to be dealt with in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar, what we find is, is some signs, and, and there's five signs I want us to look like that, that, that are, are like these speed limit signs that say, you got to slow down and consider this. Because there's many people that try to say, well, Nebuchadnezzar was saved, and there's evidence of that as we look through the scripture. And I'm not quite so sure. I think he may have eventually gotten there, but he got there after a very traumatic experience in his life that we won't hear about till next week. And so I want to walk through what has happened thus far to get us to think about our own lives and the lives of people that we care about. If you look at the end of chapter two, let me give you a statement and then I want to show you in the scripture. Here's the statement, first sign. Just because someone has an emotional response and makes big declarations does not necessarily mean that they are saved. Just because somebody has had an emotional response, they have tears, they've gone forward somewhere, they've raised a hand somehow, they've reacted in such a way to some truth that's come at their life. I did that when I was seven years old, and I listened to my home pastor, I'd listen to an evangelist, and I would feel this guilt and shame over stuff that was going on in my life, and I'd have an emotional response, but just because I had an emotional response doesn't necessarily mean I was saved. The question had to come, did true life transformation take place? How do I know that? I want you to think through. If you remember the story, and if you weren't here, last week we looked at how Daniel was the one that was able to interpret, both give the the king his dream, tell him what the dream was, and then interpret it. The other people that came in, the king said, I want you to tell me my dream, and then interpret it. And they said, there's nobody can do that. There's no man alive can do that. Only the gods could do that, and they don't live among men. And we said that Daniel said, hey, I'm just like every other guy, but there is a God in heaven, and he's shown you something, and he's shown it to me so I can tell you, and he interpreted the dream after he told him the dream. And how did Nebuchadnezzar respond to all that? Well, look with me at the end of chapter 2, beginning of verse 46. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel 
and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. And the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. And then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. And he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. And moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Please note several things that took place. He humbled himself before God's servant. He had an emotional response to, surely your God is the God of gods, but please note that, is the God of gods, not is God, but is the God of gods. I'm still entertaining many gods, but he's the top dog. See, that's not submitting to God as God. That's just saying God's pretty special. So he humbled himself before he fell down before Daniel, and he declared that Daniel's God is powerful, but among many gods. He had this response, and he declared that Daniel's God was powerful, but among others. Saul did the same thing. I want you to know, if you know the story of Saul, he was supposed to go and kill all the Amalekites and all their sheep and everything, and Samuel went to challenge him, and when he did, he said to him, what's the bleeding of sheep that I hear in the background? And Saul said to him, I brought them to worship the Lord your God, not the Lord our God, not the Lord my God, the Lord your God. See, some of us have walked this journey to where we've had this reaction, but we're not submitting yet to God as Almighty God and me as a needy person. We're saying, God, you are somebody. But we kind of leave it there. And we still go ahead and do life according to how I think life should happen. And so it's very clear. And then he honored God's servant. He lifted Daniel up, he gave him some gifts, he put him in charge of all the wise men, and he lifted up his friends, made them people over top of other people. I just want us to understand that just because somebody says, well, yeah, God's amazing, and, and I go to church, and I'm friends with Pastor Pat, and, and I think he's a good guy, or I think the church is great, just because we're talking positively about these things does not mean that we've come into a relationship with Jesus. Those are declarations we're making. But it's not about declarations. It's about life transformation. In fact, let me show you what he did as far as this is concerned. The second sign is just this. People can take and adapt God to their lives rather than submitting their lives to God. People can take and adapt God into their life. Now, if you remember the dream, the dream that Daniel said, here's the dream you had, king. There's this big statue, and this statue at the top is all made of gold. The head and the arms and the, the chest, everything, that's made of gold. And then he describes the rest of the statue that was in the dream, and he talks about five different governments that are going to be in place as we go along. And Daniel said, the Lord has put you at the top, that gold piece up there, that's you, king. That's you. And so God has placed you as kind of ruler over all the earth right now. You're in a high position because God has put you there. So you've got to admit, it's kind of interesting that what is the thing that Nebuchadnezzar does? Nebuchadnezzar takes and he adapts that into his life and so he makes this big idol. It's like 90 feet tall, and it's a skinny thing. It's only about nine feet wide, and so this tall, skinny thing. And he says, now, when you hear the music play, you bow down and you worship this thing. I want you to know something that has been true of me in the past, and maybe is true of you. And we've got to be careful about how we preach the gospel. When we present a gospel as telling people all the wonderful things that God wants to do for them, 
without presenting a gospel that says, but it begins with our submission to him. What people will do is say, of course I want all that. I was joking with Miss Donna, we, we made the announcement at first service that, hey, we're having the training for mega camp and food is going to be provided. And she said, man, they blew right through the 60 people that had signed up. I said, it was all the food, right? Provide food and they'll come. You see, people respond to felt needs. And if I hear, and I want you to hear what Daniel said, and I want you to hear what the king heard. Daniel said, you are in this high position. You are that gold piece of that statue because God has placed you there. What you have in your life, all the good things you have in your life, the direction you're going in, and maybe you're here today and you are top of your heap. You are, you are really doing well in life. You, you are recognized by your company. All these wonderful things are happening for you. You are there because God has chosen to place you there. But what the king heard, Daniel says, God, God, God. Nebuchadnezzar hears, me, me, me. I'm somebody special because he needed validated. He needed to feel like he was somebody. And that's what he heard. And so he adapted God into this by making this big idol. And he expects everybody to bow down and worship that. Not worship God, but worship his idol and his gods because he is the top dog. That's how he heard it. Now, I don't know how you've adapted God into your life, but if you're picking the things of God and the blessings that are talked about in this book about God and from God, and you're not choosing to acknowledge God as God, then I'm encouraging you to slow down and listen to what he has to say, because I did come to the conclusion long ago, the only one that can get me into heaven is God himself. You see, it is by grace we have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. The gift is something you receive, not something you achieve. And so for us, we need to not adapt God into our life. We need to submit our life to Almighty God. And I think of one friend that I had that, that he went through a, a pretty tragic time, and I met with him. He actually got freed from demons that were in his life. And I said, the Bible says you've got to fill your life up with something different, man, or something worse is going to happen. And then he disappeared. And he was out living with somebody and doing all kinds of things, but was not committed to the Lord. And then another tragic thing happened to his life. And then finally he came to submit his life to the Lord. He was trying to adapt God into his life, but wasn't submitting his life to God. Now, how do you know that that's taking place? I'm glad you asked because right here, we're going to see exactly how we know. Look at the next thing that takes place. Attitudes and anger are clear indications of where somebody is. Attitudes and anger. I don't know about you, but through my life, when there were issues going on in my life that I wasn't following the Lord, and somebody would challenge me about those or bring those to me and point them out to me, there were times where I didn't like that, and so I would respond in anger toward, don't tell me that, don't judge me. As a pastor, I hear that all the time when I raise that with people. And, and they get angry about it. Why? Because they don't like a mirror being held up to see what they see and to hear what God has to say about it. People will always bring up, you're judging me, you're judging me. I'm not judging. In fact, let me show you something I think is really important because this is one of the passages of Scripture that Pam and I come back to over and over and over again. It tells us, beginning of verse 10 in chapter 3, it says, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the prophets of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's jealousy at work here. 
They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you set up. Furious with rage. Note that. Furious with rage. Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to save you from my hand? Well, isn't this the guy that just acknowledged the God of Daniel? Isn't this a guy that lifted these guys up into a prominent position? Why is he suddenly turning on them in anger? Because he had an agenda that had to do with him, and he had not submitted to the Lord as God. That's why. It's very clear. And his agenda wasn't being met. He is being dishonored, and that will not happen. And he is furious with rage. What gets you angry? You see, I came to the conclusion a long time ago that the scriptures are true when they say that it's a wonderful thing to have the rebuke of a friend. When a friend comes and speaks into my life about an area that needs to be addressed in my life, I need to receive them as a gift from God, not as somebody that's judging me. And when God sends those people, we ought to thank God for that. But he didn't. He got ticked. See, a person that's living a life of transformation, ongoing transformation, they won't get ticked. They'll stop and slow down enough to pay attention to see whether it's something really to deal with or not deal with, and they'll allow that to be a part of the process of transformation for them. But when you are not living under the Lord and you're living under your own idols, you'll get ticked about such things. In fact, it goes on that after they responded to him, it says that his attitude towards them changed. And I've experienced that as a pastor a number of times, and and I just think about how does my attitude, how do I respond to people around me that maybe do this for me? So see, anger is a good indication. Attitudes are a good indication of where we are, whether we're slowing down in this zone or whether we're just speeding right through because we have an agenda. Now, what happens in the midst of all this for believers? What about if God is using you and placed you in a position where you can speak into the life of somebody? Well, I just want you to note something that's important here. The fourth point is this. We must obey God rather than justify compromise because of somebody's good intentions. We must obey God rather than justify compromise because of good intentions. Let me explain what I mean. I've watched, and, and I've been tempted to do this, probably have been guilty of it, and maybe you have. Pastor Justin uses a term that I, I think is, is well-placed. I believe there are times that we work with corrupt compassion. And what I mean by corrupt compassion is that, that we feel so deeply for people that we take actions that we feel are based on compassion towards somebody when really what we're doing is compromising truth. Let me illustrate it here. It kind of was brilliant that Nebuchadnezzar built this thing because it reflected his dream. Somebody could take that and say, well, you know, he doesn't quite understand yet. And so this really isn't such a bad thing. Why don't we go ahead and we're not going to really bow down to this idol as if we're worshiping it. But it's a way that we can encourage Nebuchadnezzar because he's kind of trying to follow the dream. He has good intentions. So let's support his good intentions by doing this thing that he asked us to do. And if you're guilty of that in some way, that you kind of say, well, it's it's okay if we kind of say that what they're doing is okay because they mean well, they intend well. It seems like they're taking some kind of step towards God. I just want to encourage us to slow down and look at what God says because, see, God says this. I am the Lord your God, 
and you will have no other God before me, and you will not make unto yourself any image of any kind to fall down and worship. And so if they would have compromised and they would have bowed down, they would have actually hurt Nebuchadnezzar, not shown him compassion. They would have left him thinking he was just fine in what he was doing. And it was okay to adapt God into his life rather than to submit. In fact, I love rather what they did. They stood with conviction to show him what it should look like. And they said to him in the conversation, and I love, and they showed true compassion. If you read the text, it says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have to defend ourselves to you regarding this matter. King, we don't have to come at you. We're not coming at you. We're, We're not trying to fight with you. We don't have to defend ourselves. Do you see what the truth says? If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, you ask the question, so we'll answer. The God we serve is able to save us. He's able to save us from your hand. But I love what they said. But even if he does not, we're still not going to bow down and worship your gods or your idol. Even if he doesn't, it's okay. He can choose to do that, but we're still not going to worship your idol. And I love that. At that point, he got so ticked. That shows where he is. He said, you make that fire even seven times hotter. So much so that some people that threw him in died because it was so hot. And they got thrown into that fire. They stood in their convictions. What was the outcome of all that? I I think it's pretty powerful because, see, when they hit the fire, and they didn't know what was going to happen to them, I I would have to assume that they thought they are toast. No pun intended. Well, yeah, it was intended, okay? But look what happens. They get thrown in, and here's a good word for us as we stand with conviction. Jesus walks with us when we walk with him. I can just see this interaction. They hit the blaze, they fall down. They stand up, wow, that looks hot. And they're walking in this fire. And Jesus shows up, guys, you're doing a great job. I know it's been a little tough here in these last few moments for you, but you're doing a great job. And I just want you to know, I'm gonna use this in Nebuchadnezzar's life because he's not there yet. But I I have to show him some things yet. And he's not there, but you guys are doing a great job and I want you to keep standing firm. Because I've got you there for a purpose too. And I could just see Jesus having a conversation. Now, here's where my sadistic nature has a little fun. Because in reaction to all this, Nebuchadnezzar, whom I think, and if you know anybody that does blind rage in your life, I I have a feeling he did blind rage. And when he did blind rage, I, I think after they went down into that fiery furnace, I think he probably felt bad that he did all that. And so he stands up and he looks in the furnace and kind of was going to watch their demise. But he sees these four people walking around in there in the fire. And at that point, he shouts, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come on out. Here's my sadistic nature. Wouldn't it have been tempting to say, no, come on in. Let's chat. I think that would have been fun. But they didn't do that. They walked out. But do you notice what the king said to his other people that were around him? Didn't we throw three guys in there? I see four. And the one looks like a son of the gods. And they walk out and they don't even smell like smoke. Anybody ever been near a fire and you didn't smell like smoke? You got to wash the clothes every time you come home. But they didn't even smell like smoke. And it tells us, it tells us that all the people around along with the king came out around them and saw they, there was no hair singed and the robes weren't scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. And here was the king's reaction. Here's the last sign. King Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own God. Please note something. 
He doesn't say anywhere there in response to all this, he truly has to be God. He just said, praise be to the God of these guys. I just want to challenge all of us. I walk through this, and there are clear signs in the Bible that we are saved. The Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. By your fruit, you will know them. We'll stand firm when these kind of things come. Our testimonies, our declarations will not be about ourselves. It will be about God himself. But more than anything, it won't be a life of perfection yet, but it will be a life of ongoing transformation. Paul said to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely so that everybody that observes you, Timothy, will watch the progression of your life. And if there is no progression going on in your life, if you're just kind of hanging around doing church, liking people and, and doing a few things once and again, but you're never truly submitting yourself to God as God, then I just appeal to you to consider, slow down enough to consider that God says it's not about adapting me to your life it's about you submitting your life to me. It's not about me being in your life. It's about me being your life. That's what salvation is all about. Where are we with that? So I want to take some time as we close the service. Andrea's going to come out and just play. And as she plays, I want to give opportunity for us just to, to kind of like guide the Holy Spirit, sift our hearts and really know us right now. And it might be that you're okay, that you, you have that testimony within you. Again, my purpose today was not to try to cause doubt for anybody. But if you're truly saved and you're living a transformed life, today should be a hallelujah. That's the way it should be. But if that's not where you are right now, then I would just get on your face before Almighty God and say, why not? Why am I disturbed by some of the things I'm hearing today? Because you see, it's not about that we'll live per perfect lives yet. I don't. But I do know that God's doing a work in me to perfect me. And every time he brings up the, the mirror to show me something, my response now is not to get angry about it. My response is, oh God, I'm so sorry. Help me. And that's where we need to be in life. So whether you stay seated there or whether you come down here, I want to open these stairs as like an altar to come before Almighty God and say, you're God, I'm not. I need you. I really need you. And I need you to help finally deal with this thing that's in me. And if you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never truly submitted to him, see, the Bible is pretty clear that God created a perfect world and then by their own human choice, Adam and Eve chose to go away from that. And all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think we're all smart enough to know that. But the only way to deal with sin is not to try to balance it out with good things that we do, because we can never do that. But it's by receiving what God has offered us, and that is he sent his son as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. That's what the gospel is really all about. And so it's by grace that we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is God's gift, not by works of righteousness that we have done, so that none of us can boast. We're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good things, yes. There will be things that flow out of it, but not because we're trying to achieve something, but because it's the natural outflow of the love of a child for their father, just to please him and to point the attention to him. If you've never begun that journey with him, then I invite you to come and, and come before him and just say, God, I need you to forgive me and help me to begin that journey. So we want to take some time to pray. You feel free to come here. You can sit there and pray, but would you all bow your heads? And let's let God, the Holy Spirit, just search us right now. We need to slow down. We need to think. We need to assess where are we. And if nothing else, then pray for somebody you know that needs to know him, that they would slow down enough not to make some great declaration, not to make an adaptation, but to truly submit to God as God.
Search us, Father, I pray. Oh, we need to slow down. Right now you're bringing things across our mind. And I thank you for that. Don't miss this moment. It's an important moment. And think about how you interact with people around you. Are you standing like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Not compromising truth, but standing firm and walking with Jesus. And he'll walk with you as you go through the tough things. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what all is dealt with right now. Right there in our pews. Or if we happen to be online, I don't think we are. If we are, then there are that seat. I just know, Lord, that we so quickly barrel through life and we adapt the good things of the gospel, but we forget the truth of what you said, Lord, when you were here. Whoever's willing to be my disciple must take up their cross daily and follow me. That means I die today and then I die tomorrow morning and I die the next day. I just stay submitted to you because you're God and I'm not. But you have promised that when I acknowledge you as God, you'll make my path straight and you'll never leave me nor forsake me. And when I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sin and purify me from all unrighteousness. That it's not because of righteous things that we have done, but by his mercy, he has saved us through the washing of regeneration that has taken place. I'm saved because of an action of God, not because of great things I've done. Boy, that simplifies it all for us. And I pray, Father, for any person here who maybe has made great declarations about who they are and what actions they've taken, but rather I pray for today that we would all just humble ourselves and recognize there's no good in me, none. There's none righteous, no, not one. But we serve a God who is righteous altogether and has said, if you come to me, you're laboring, you're laden down with all kind of concerns, I will give you rest. And may we find rest in you alone today. So thank you for hearing us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for causing us to slow down enough that we not live like a Nebuchadnezzar. We not go from emotional experience to emotional experience to emotional experience, making great declarations about you. But we just quietly and humbly every day say, you are God. You are God. You are God. What would you have me do today, Lord? And we just enjoy life that way. Staying in the bounds that you have established and enjoying life to its full. May it be true not only for those that are within the sound of my voice, Lord, but for all those that we care about. That's how you begin the journey of long haul leadership. It begins with making sure you're on the right path. And that path is found in Jesus Christ alone. To whom all glory and honor and praise belong. We pray that in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You know, the God of Daniel is the God that we serve today. Amen. The God of Moses is the God of the disciples, is our God today. He is the same God. Amen? Why don't we stand and worship him?
You know, grace is an amazing thing. We started with some um, openness. Let me end with some openness. How many of you, when it's a 55, you go 62? <laughs> you see, isn't it amazing? Because what I hear always, well, they give you grace for that much. Grace is an amazing thing. But I just want to make sure that we don't misuse grace and confuse the grace of God for license to say, so I can kind of go over his speed limits and it's okay. God is not a legalist, don't get me wrong. He's not a legalist, but at the same time, he does make very clear boundaries that you don't get to set the boundaries, he does. And grace is given so that we'll come to him and acknowledge him as the one that governs all of that not get to do that and just kind of adapt him in to our life because life is about transformation not adaptation it's about submission not setting our own agendas and so i pray that we'll all live that way and consider what we've heard today as we go one of the things that i'm really excited about in just a few weeks we're going to have dr kevin lehman here it's going to be a a fun time he's a timeless speaker he his age betrays doesn't betray him at all he he will be just as entertaining in his presentation but very thorough in the truth of what he has to share so he'll be speaking in the morning services he will be here talking about marriage issues on Sunday night he'll be doing some things on leadership and and among moms uh, on Monday morning and then Monday night be talking about parenting there's information ehwc.org slash events or Lehman, uh, you can go there and find out more information. It's a real inexpensive way to come and get built up, encouraged, and resourced in ways that we can show leadership in our homes. Encourage your friends to come and join you for that weekend. So Father, as we go, Jesus, you said the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. It's that kind of thing that happens when we aren't paying attention to the speed limit signs. But you said you came to give life and give it to the full. And that's what we can experience when we're walking with you. So I pray this week that we will practice what your word teaches us. That when we walk with you, you walk with us. And life is amazing because of it. May it be true for us and for those whom we care for. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go. You
heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You were providing then, you are providing now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You moved in power then, God moved in power now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You Your faithfulness, oh God, my. God. 